This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. And by Cafe Himbo Cookbooks, celebrating his 10th anniversary. Thank you. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and coffin wholesaler. There is a certain unique flavor to bad movies of the 1980s. The abundant fromage of the decade itself combining with the cheesiness of the film, the booming home video market creating a broad avenue for cheap exploitation, and a reliance on tropes and values that have aged like fine brimstone. And when you have a musical, you throw early MTV sensibilities in for extra cheesiness. Put it all together and you have the big bubbling fondue pot that is our next offender, Rockula. This horror comedy musical, which lives up to about two-thirds of that cross-genre and that's being generous, comes to us from our good friends at Canon Pictures, whose offerings range from the delicious ridiculousness of the apple to the woefully cheap Canon movie tales. Rockula falls kind of in the middle of the spectrum, with the additional cringe of being one of those lame supernaturally tinged sex comedies that the late 80s liked for some reason. And yes, this is a late 80s movie despite being released in 1990. Due to canon filing for bankruptcy, it sat on the shelf for two years, then got a quick theatrical release before being unceremoniously buried in the VHS graveyard. So let's examine the case of Rockula and see what we unearth. After one of those animated credit sequences that were unusually popular in the 80s, we open with a caped figure going all Phantom of the Opera at an organ. Yep, this is the kind of humor you can expect for the next hour and a half. This is our vampire protagonist, Ralph, who lives with his embarrassing vampire mom, Phoebe, and his rather unorthodox sentient reflection. I know this legend thing is tough. Let's take a moment and reflect. Reflect! Get it! I think this reflection is the after effect of a curse we'll get to momentarily, but I know he's sin number one. The reflection fills perhaps one of the most dated character tropes in 80s movies, that of the horny best friend who mostly exists to lust after women and make crude jokes. I wonder if, uh... <laughs> yeah, it gets old fast. Oh yeah, the curse. According to the recap Ralph gives to his exposition friends, 400 years ago he fell in love with a human girl named Mona and she with him, only at the time Mona was dating a pirate with a rhinestone peg leg who didn't take too kindly to the change in her affections, hit her over the head with a ham bone and killed her on Halloween night. So now Mona keeps getting reincarnated every 22 years, and Ralph keeps meeting her on Friday, October 13th and losing her on the 31st until he can find a way to save her. Only he's gotten tired of going through the same routine over and over, so he's decided to lock himself in his room on the 13th so he can't meet Mona. This plan doesn't even last a minute past midnight. Oh god, Mona. Mona is perplexed by the fact that Ralph appears to be uninjured by the accident and that he knows her name, but he pushes her away in a manner that under normal circumstances would be enough to turn her off to him before running off to sulk. That's right. Forget it. Just forget the fact that we are the oldest living virgins walking the planet. What are you talking about? You're the biggest slut I know every time I see you with a different girl. You know what? Ralph's horn dog reflection is annoying, but Ralph himself isn't much better. He's mostly a whiny, ineffectual mope, and apart from his fangs, isn't all that different from most teen comedy protagonists of the era. He acts like a high school loser despite being somewhere around half a millennium old, he's not particularly phased by crosses or garlic, and he gets beat up by mere humans on the regular. About the only vampire trait he has is the whole sunlight allergy, which is instantly hand-waved into irrelevance. I'm protected. Ah -ha, ah -ha. And that brings us to sin number three, which is the jokes are pretty toothless. And yes, in this case, the pun is very much intended. When you look at the great horror comedies, 
Ghostbusters, Beetlejuice, the Evil Dead series, the horror aspect isn't glossed over or an afterthought. Amid all the jokes are scenes that are bizarre, macabre, and in some cases legitimately frightening. Rockula, meanwhile, settles for half-hearted gags regarding the protagonist's nominal vampire status. He wears a retainer over his fangs, gets a daily blood delivery instead of milk, that kind of thing. It's the sort of humor you'd expect to find in a Saturday Night Live sketch that got cut a day or two before airtime. Ralph is still determined to avoid his date with Destiny, but when he goes to bed, on an ordinary twin mattress instead of a coffin because he's the lamest vampire ever, he has a bizarre music video dream urging him to action. I do like Dream Ralph going all Odysseus to avoid his fate. When this movie goes full early MTV weird, it's at its... I'm not sure if best is the word, but you can see why it has fans. The dream convinces Ralph to make one last play at saving Mona, as instinct tells him if he fails this time, he'll lose her forever. So he goes out to track her down in a montage accompanied by the worst song in the movie. And that's saying something. The montage also proves pointless, as Horndog Reflection points out that since Destiny's involved, Ralph will probably find Mona eventually, and sure enough, here comes an extra with a flyer for Mona's gig at Club Hell. <laughs> See, in this lifetime, Mona is a rock singer, and she hangs out with her Velma Dinkley-esque bandmate and her manager slash ex-boyfriend slash coffin salesman slash yes, that really is Thomas Dolby, Stanley. Stanley hawking coffins like a used car salesman is the closest this movie gets to genuinely morbid humor, and it doesn't take it anywhere near as far as it could. Ralph turns up to catch Mona's set, which isn't terrible, but... Yeah, it's not exactly out tonight. After the performance, Ralph manages to have a talk with Mona backstage, which, since he spends most of the time denying that he's stalking her, isn't the best of first impressions. He also knows he can't exactly lead with, I'm an immortal bloodsucker who still lives with my mom for unspecified reasons, and you're the latest incarnation of my long-lost love, so he deflects her questions about his job by claiming to be in a band. Mona offers to come watch him perform, forcing him to follow through with the cover story, which isn't a bad thing, as it will enable him to move in the same circles as her and put a couple centuries of music lessons to good use. Also, one of his friends is literally Bo fucking Diddley, so he's got that going for him. So Ralph and his exposition buddies set out to create their group through that least beloved of 80s movies trends, the trying on clothes montage. Dog Reflection's sarcastic suggestion, Ralph decides to style himself as Rockula and play up the vampire thing in his act. Which sounds like a decent idea, but sin number five is how disappointing the results are. For starters, Ralph's theming, and I'm sorry, but there really is no other word for it, sucks. You would think a late 80s rock act with a vampire gimmick would lean heavily into the Alice Cooper Ozzy Osbourne school, with some Lost Boys thrown in for spice. The best Ralph can manage is a uh, kind of bat cape with his nom de scène written on it. Then there's his music. His theme song, which is all about how bad he is at being a vampire, has nothing going for it except Bo Diddley's kick and bass lick. So he stays all night. At least I think that's him playing on the track. The instrument miming is so horrendous it's hard to tell. And it gets worse, because someone decided that Ralph needed to get in on the rap music the kids are so into these days. Are you the DJ? No, I'm the vampire. No, 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 go past this, past this part. In fact, never play this again. 
Ralph's performance is inexplicably popular with hair metal dudes, Rocky Horror Extras, and Glinda from Wicked, and he also starts hitting it off with Mona, who is all, I feel like I know you from somewhere. Stanley, who still has designs on Mona, is annoyed by the competition, and Phoebe seems determined to sabotage the whole thing for reasons of her own. These two antagonist tracks collide when Stanley goes to consult his psychic, who is not, I repeat, not, obviously Phoebe in disguise. Oh, I see her within the domain. That little twerp. Totally not Phoebe tells Stanley that his rival is a vampire who has put the whammy on Mona, and it's Stanley's destiny to rescue her and make her realize he is her one true love. Also, Destiny expects him to do this on Halloween night while dressed as a rhinestone peg-legged pirate wielding a ham bone. Stanley is on board with this idea and decides to make things extra creepy. I can freeze her cryogenically. Oh, I suppose they will wear. She'll be mine. All mine forever. Now, I'm a little wary about calling this next one out because I'm pretty sure it's intended. But it's still irritating me, so sin number six, Stanley is a much better vampire than any of the actual vampires in this movie. I mean, look at him. He's got long hair, pale skin, a posh accent, the most charitable term for his wardrobe is eclectic, he even drives the Munster's car for Lucifer's sake. I mean, here, his dastardly scheme for Mona essentially involves giving her an unnatural form of eternal life and making her sleep in a coffin, which, although this is never really capitalized on, has a subliminal messaging option. Not a foreign language while you're waiting to be awoken from your everlasting sleep. Did you die a smoker? Quit while you're dead! Cause you know, if you can't manipulate your victim's mind with your unholy supernatural powers, store-bought is fine. Again, I suspect the writers are deliberately flipping the script here, pitting an eccentric, ghoulish human against an average Joe vampire. But it just makes me think about how much I wish this movie had gone full what we do in the shadows with a genuine blood-sucking fiend for a protagonist instead of a guy who needs nothing so much as a good cosmetic dentist. Ralph and Mona are in full romantic montage mode, getting their portrait done by a street caricaturist and running through the rain and having a... dream sequence? Music video? Thing? Whatever, there's five minutes where they lose each other in a homeless camp and need a trio of cassettes to help them reunite. It has nothing to do with anything in the plot, but there you go. The bad news is Stanley is strongly hinting that he's in on Ralph's secret, and Ralph isn't on board with Horndog Reflection's idea of just ripping his throat out. Realizing that the truth will go over better if it comes from him, Ralph decides to fill Mona in, after dinner with Phoebe and her latest squeeze. Mom, what's for dinner? Meat and potatoes! Who's asking? Oh, boom boom! He's a pro wrestler, or something. Phoebe does everything she can to make the experience as awkward as possible, from name-dropping all the historical figures she's boffed, to doing an impromptu song and dance because, hey, if you're casting Tony Basil in your singing vampire movie, you damn well better use her. Turns out Phoebe does this rock vampire thing a lot better than her son, although her rapping also leaves a bit to be desired. And jamming is what I'll do, and I'll jam the house, I'll jam it down on you. The end result is Ralph and Mona drive away in that uncomfortable silence that always follows meeting your significant other's weird relatives. Mona, would you give up everything for me? Your career, your friends, everything? Big red flags! Ralph tells Mona he's a vampire, which understandably she doesn't believe as there's Jack All that's vampirish about him. The whole you're going to die in a few days things goes even less well, so Ralph decides to offer incontrovertible proof. Mona freaks out and flees, and who wouldn't, so we get a sad montage where Ralph and Mona alternate between moping around the house and wandering through the streets. So by the time Halloween rolls around, Ralph is about ready to give up, Mona's planning on leaving town, and Stanley is explaining to Totally Not Phoebe that it's not easy to find a rhinestone peg leg at the last minute on Halloween. Hello? Madame Benoit? Her alias is Madame Benoit? The whole skipping town thing doesn't go so well for Mona, as her airport shuttle breaks down, giving her time to rethink the whole thing by contemplating their caricature drawing. As romantic keepsakes go, 
I've seen better. So everybody ends up back at Club Hell, where not Velma and the Cosettes. That's a genuinely good band name. Understudy for Mona, and Stanley gets some last-minute assistance. You remember, before midnight! What a twist! Mona and Ralph reunite on stage, but Phoebe is in the crowd, dressed as a hula flamingo? And she distracts Ralph long enough for Stanley to nab Mona from the stage. <laughs> about five minutes to go until midnight, Ralph races to find out where Stanley's taken Mona. Unfortunately, Horndog Reflection knows exactly where they are. Unfortunately, because he's being an absolute dick about it. Tell me, where is she? Not until you apologize. <laughs> Ralph does come to the rescue just as Stanley is about to force Mona into the cryo chamber, and they engage in a fight that's not bad enough to be funny. The it's not. It's too. Ralph is just starting to get his rant on about how he's always been pushed around and nobody believed in him except his mother, which Phoebe arrives just in time to overhear. Madame Benoit? Mrs. Levy. Madame Benoit. Janet! Bad! Rook! Yeah, so Phoebe has been perpetuating this whole curse thing to prevent her baby boy from leaving her, but now she realizes she just wants him to be happy or whatever. Anyway, Ralph defeats Stanley using the only thing that's remotely creepy about him. <coughs> Stanley is frozen, and provided with some good subliminal tips for improving his golf swing. The curse is broken, Phoebe is easily forgiven for monkey-wrenching the past four centuries of her son's life, not to mention causing the deaths of a few dozen 22-year-old women. And we're left behind with the most annoying character in the movie. Hey, it makes about as much sense as everything else we've seen. Rockula has a great concept, which it proceeds to do absolutely nothing with. If it had gone all out on the vampire aspect, or at least acknowledged it beyond a few jokes, it could have been a genuinely fun cult movie. As it is, there's not much that separates it from a host of other dumb 80s romantic comedies. Therefore, the Court of Musical Hell condemns those involved to an eternity stuck with their horny, wisecracking reflections. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs>